thank you uh, so much for everyone who's hanging with us. Thank you so much for Terry for being here today. Um, so I'm Erica and I'm the Director of Product Strategy and Community Experience at CMX. And I will be facilitating this webinar with Terry. Um, I'm super excited to have her on today. Um, Terry is a community builder and she's the community success manager at Asana. She'll also be speaking at CMX Summit, which I'm super thrilled to have her as part of our lineup this year. It's gonna be so good. Um, those of you who haven't heard, we just sold out tickets today. I'm so excited. Um, if you're like, oh my gosh, I really wanted to go, you can sign up for the wait list. We may be able to sneak you in. Cross your fingers. <laughs> So anyway, to kick us off, uh, Terry is a blogger, speaker, and brand set strategist who empowers women who struggle with tech to leverage social media personal and personal branding to grow their audience and impact. She also manages a flourishing online community of more than 4,000 ambitious women on a mission via the Mocha Girls Pit Stop blog, which is where women of color refuel on motivation and ignite their lives. So Terry today is specifically going to be talking about managing an online community through a company acquisition, things like how to transition and rebuild or maybe close down your community, how to define your goals around this stuff, how to get buy-in and how to transition both the company and the community members, what things you should look at to measure the success of how you do this, how to gather customer feedback and use it to inform leadership's goals and communicating the changes with your community as well as supporting them through the, this transition. And so if you have any questions for Terry at any point during this call, you can pop them in the little chat feature and we will make sure to ask them as well. So welcome. <laughs> Super thrilled to have you here. And to kick us off, can you talk about the purpose and business objective of your community? So everyone can kind of, you know, understand stand the scope of your experience and the community you're talking about. For sure. So I'd love to start with the Mocha Girls Pit Stop community. It's separate from the community that um, we have at Asana. And so for my blog, the goal there and the purpose of the community is to really provide a safe space for Black women and women of color to just be themselves, talk about the tough issues that their communities face. And um, the thing about the community for Mocha Girls Pit Stop, as far as the business objective goes, it's a little unique because that blog was built for the community as opposed to me building the community for the blog. And so the blog was kind of an afterthought. My main goal there was to create this safe space where we could just have these conversations that we were all kind of having in our heads or you know, in our families, but kind of connecting us all. Um, now, when we talk about the Asana community, that community serves as sort of a low touch um, support forum where we have volunteers from around the country that help each other with best practices and strategies on how they use the tool. And so um, that community is twofold. We have the amazing volunteers and it's also the support forum, but then we have like this occult following where folks are like really into our unicorns and the cool features that we have and the product in general. So that's kind of the difference between those two communities there. Nice. So have your goals around these two communities always been clear? Um, you know, kind of when and how was it defined? I know a lot of communities, sometimes your goals evolve organically. Sometimes it comes out of like this like very clear need and other times it's like, we know there's something there that we need to do <laughs> and then you figure it out over time. For sure. I would say that for the for the blog, the goals there, I thought they were clear. I mean, it was my first blog ever I started six years ago. And so I didn't really know what I was doing. And so I kind of just, um, luckily, my target market is very similar to me. So I was like, okay, great. I have this 
idea. I'm just going to run with it. And as I got feedback, I began to tweak the community goals and make it more for the community. So that was really helpful there. Um, I was also an RA in college. And so I learned a lot about community building in college and being a residence director. And the thing is, a lot of the skills that I learned in school as a you know hall director and RA, they're transferable. And so many of us have these, tool, these tools and strategies that we use in our daily work or in outside you know side hustles that we can pull into the work that we do. And so I would say for the blog, the goals were definitely tweaked along the journey. Um, for the sauna, I, I would say, the, I think the goals were pretty much set in stone when they started the community. I wasn't part of that process initially, but as a customer success manager, I work closely with the community. So I see my colleagues in community, I help them with moderation. And so I think the goals there were for it to be a support forum and to also connect people that really enjoyed the product. For sure. I think a lot of us, you know, started community building, doing things we didn't necessarily think were community building or because there was a need. Um, you know, we on the CMX team have talked a lot about like our own personal histories. And it's like, I was in 4-H for a long time. And like, I like, was like this kid leader of like my 4-H rabbit club. Mm -hmm. And like, that was community building. <laughs> And I did things in college, you know, that were kind of along that same vein. And it's like, oh, yeah, th these are the skills that we've gathered and like we've brought together. And now we're using them professionally or we're using them to build side hustles or whatever is happening in what you need in this world. It's so cool. It's so true. <laughs> so, true. so can you talk about the specific situation where you've had a community that was uh, closed or radically changed by an organization? For sure. I had a very, it was a very unique situation because it was sort of like an acquisition meets rebrand or meets closure meets rebrand all in one. And so I want to, I don't want to talk about the company specifically. So I'll just use like a fictitious company for the purpose of the example. And so basically I get my first role at a startup and I'm a community manager and it's all new information and I'm like pulling from these different experiences that I've had that were like more informal. So my blogging, um, you know, it's my blog, started that community builder, did, you know, pulled from the RA and RD stuff from college. And in this company, I was a few months into the role and they say, hey, so we're, we're gonna be shutting down. And we just kind of learned more information as we went along. And so it was a really tough situation, but I wanna kind of paint the scenario for you all. And so let's just say the company is called Doggy Care. Let's just go, let's just, you know, very pet friendly environment. So we'll say the company is called Doggy Care. And so basically Doggy Care is a company that allows you to find local dog sitters to dog sit for you. And as you, you know, collaborate with people in the app, you get doggy coins, which allows you to buy things and product. And they're usually like usable items from other folks that have pets. And so, they were basically, you know, they said, hey, we're going to shut down. We didn't have too much information initially, but we got more information later and found out that they were going to rebrand the company and the new company no longer aligned with the goals of the previous company. So the community, it wouldn't really be necessary to have the community. And so that was um, definitely a tough situation. <laughs> a little stressful there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, just a little bit. <laughs> Having a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how big was that community that you were working on? Do you remember? We were managing our community with Facebook. And so I want to say maybe around at our peak, maybe around 2,500 to 3,000 members. They were very active to the community members. So they had probably hundreds of thousands of folks using the actual, the app, but about a couple of thousand or so in that community. So you had a lot of people that, um, you know, they may not be active you know, in the community themselves, but it sounds like they had these like coins and this sort of expectation that they had put some effort into this mm -hmm. product and we're going to get something out of it as well. Mm -hmm. So you have that added transactional community relationship with, which I think a lot of us, you know, have, um, you know, I work for a company that gave like virtual points when you answer questions in their Q&A form. And people took that super seriously. Um, they were actually very upset when former community managers were no longer with the company. And the, those community managers were like on the leaderboard really high because they were no longer staff. And it was a whole, you know, it was a whole thing, but you could get real 
rewards with these points. Like you could get a ticket to their conference, you could get swag and things like that. And people really expected that. So I think, you know, there's that sort of added, um, you know, that, that like extrinsic, <laughs> intrinsic pull that you're dealing with. Um, so how did you start to tackle this? Like when you, when you found out what was kind of your strategy to say like, okay, this huge change, um, I, I kind of assume from what you said, maybe you did say explicitly that you didn't have a, maybe wouldn't have a job after this change. Um, I know that often happens when there's higher, you know, acquisitions and things like that. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm actually getting a little stressed as we speak about this because I'm remembering the reaction the community had. And so luckily they were they were definitely open to keeping me on the team after the transition. But I think initially when I heard about it, my heart just really went out to the community because I just felt really bad. And I tried to advocate for them as a community manager, of course, you know, as much as possible. But there were certain things that I couldn't do anything about. So as far as the coins they had, I was like, let's let's try to, you know, help everyone use their coins but the coins were, would be obsolete in the, as the transition and the acquisition went on. And so that was pretty awful. Um, but as far as the strategy, my, the most important thing for me was being as transparent as I could with the community. Because I think we all, most people are very smart, right? We all know when someone's trying to pull the wool over our eyes and we want to make sure that, I, I wanted to make sure the community didn't think that I was trying to deceive them. And so one of the most challenging aspects of, for me was knowing fully where the community was going like I knew the demise of the company but having to be the face of the community and also be there with them communicate with them strategize brainstorm ideas for this this patch of time that I knew how it was going to end they didn't necessarily know and so that was a really tough part but I think being transparent was so important to me and so as soon as we figured out you know what our internal team was going to do I scheduled an AMA you know ask me anything with the CEO and myself and we got on Facebook Live, it wasn't the easiest thing to do, but we wanted to create a forum where the folks, you know, folks in the community could ask questions and get clarity. And I think it also helped because we put a face to the message, right? So they didn't just see the company sending out this message saying, hey guys, we're, we're closing down. Sorry about your coins, but we were able to, you know, come to them as human beings. And I think we all know at the end of the day, like, okay, they could see that we were very genuine. We were like, you know, the, the business is not sustainable. We, we had this great idea. It started off this way and we're not, profitable and so there's no way for us to to continue to move in this direction and I think you know, what what can you say to someone when they're just like this isn't profitable I mean I think, I think we all know that you need money to sustain things and so I think we got a lot of empathy but there were some people that were just they were not thrilled and they left the community mm -hmm. and that taught me two valuable lessons and one is that you know in the midst of a situation like that people will leave whether it's employees we had a lot of folks leave the company as well as community members that were I mean, champions, our key moderators, they decided to leave as well. And we tried to keep them, but some folks, they, that's just best, you know, for them to leave. And that's kind of, it's their prerogative. And I think the second is that, you know, being as transparent as the business will allow, like always try to advocate for them and try to be as honest as you can be. So I'm curious, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> I'm like, I have a lot of questions now. <laughs> um, but how did you, so you had this, you know, Facebook Live, honest conversation with your community and your CEO was there with you um, to provide that kind of extra, extra face, extra like support message. Um, how did you convince your CEO to do that? Was, you know, did you get any pushback? Um, you know, how did they feel about that plan? That's a good question. So AMAs were something they did in the company regularly, but I think for me, you know, outside of the work that I did in the community, I was typically going live in my communities and doing stuff like that outside of work. And so I was more comfortable. So I kind of took the lead role and just assured him that everything was going to be okay. I made sure that he was prepped and he had everything that he needed. And he was such a great guy as well. And so um, I think he understood that transparency was key, but I think also just advocating for the community and sharing the feedback that I got from the community um, in regards to the changes and being able to let them know that it is important for us to get get in front of this right so meet with them let them know what's going on and so it ended up being a very positive experience for us both um very stressful as i said before but also very positive and i think that the community appreciated that but i think the the ceo he was definitely on board and having a layer of organization and like structure to the 
to the call and, you know, like having questions pre-made versus taking questions that come in live because I think most communities or many communities do have trolls and folks that are not there to positively contribute. And so we wanted to eliminate the, you know, those, those tough questions that we probably wouldn't be best for us to dive into on a live. We wanted to make sure that we had structure for the CEO. Um, we did take a few questions live, but we were sure to have a few questions in the queue that were sort mm -hmm. of, that he was able to kind of see beforehand. I think that was helpful. Definitely. And I think, you know, as community managers, we, we know probably the questions that are going to be asked <laughs> and the things people are really curious or concerned about. Um, you know, I was with a company who went through a rebrand and one of like, one of my pre rebrand tasks was write up all the questions I think we're going to have and write like, some canned responses um, for, I mean, we had like 700 tweets every hour. So like those canned responses helped us be very quick on our feet. And that was just Twitter. Um, but, you know, it kind of helped all the community team, all the customer support and success folks be on the same page and be able to say like, you know, here's the questions we knew you were going to ask beforehand. <laughs> like, let's get you the best answer in the best way <laughs> possible and bring, you know, who we are and what we're talking about to you. For sure. Um, so I'm curious, and we had, we have a question to around the feedback that you got from people. Um, I'm curious how you delivered that. Um, Cause I'm, you know, sometimes, especially because you probably did deal with a lot of negative feedback. There are probably lots of people who were upset. You know, how do you kind of dig through that and, you know, deliver something that has impact and can actually help people who are working in other parts of the company instead of just being like, I'm really upset because my coins went away. And I think you all are like ripping me off or something. Like I can imagine you probably got some feedback like that, which is not really helpful for, you know, the company going forward and how they're changing things. For sure. I would say that one thing I did was I really tapped into the community champions. And so if you're a community manager and you don't have like a group of moderators or like your go-to group, get them like ASAP. Because I think it made, it made it a lot easier for my job, you know, for me and my job when I wasn't around, they were, we were all on the same page. So we had our own private group chat where we talked about things in the community. And so having them as allies was really helpful so that if I was at work in a strategic meeting or, you know, doing something, they could always answer certain questions or they could sort of uh, reframe some of the conversations within the community and moving forward like after we made the announcement because we kind of we kind of slowly brought it to the community and made a few changes and then kind of you know made the announcement and gave them a deadline on when everything will kind of slow down or close down and so over the course of that time frame we focused on a lot of the positives so you know what came out of the community you know over the past few years as they if they as they've been together that have positive, you know, impacts on their lives, their, their pets lives, right. Or whoever was impacted by that community. And so we touched on a lot of that. Um, we did a lot of giveaways and a lot of fun activities to kind of like commemorate what, what was originally this amazing flourishing community. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that was, that was key getting on the same page with champions and being a unified front and then kind of reframing the energy in the group being strategic about the content we posted as well. Awesome. So we did have a question about the positive feedback and the positive angles and what you can do there. Um, but th that question was followed up with, did anyone in the community like really step forward and want to like save the community and be like, here's all the solutions. Like I can fix your business <laughs> or <laughs> I can, you know, I can make this continue. Like how can we as a community continue? Yes, we absolutely did. And there were so many ideas. Oh, it was so amazing to see all the ideas come from the community. I would say our champions, they were, they were, they were so, they were so incredible. I mean, they were definitely interested in, in helping the community thrive and survive. The only the issue that we ran into was just bandwidth and resources and, and, you know, cost. It was very costly to keep the app open, but we did consider that it was something that was on the table, you know, keeping the app open so they could use it. But then what we decided is that we were going to transition the community over so that they could still have their space, but it would be community run. So it would kind of be like a, you know, moderator run 
and sort of group. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not too sure how they're doing today, but I know they did keep that going for a while, but we definitely have folks that wanted to chip in and help them survive. Many of the ideas just were not feasible. So that was kind of unfortunate, but um, we did have people that wanted to. Yeah, it can be pretty surprising how people will, you know, continue that community or really want to take it on in a different manner. Um, I know uh, one kind of like fam really famous case study is Fiskars. They they make like uh, crafting scissors and <laughs> you know, like gardening shears and other sorts of things like that nature. Uh, they built this like incredible craft community. They had all these meetups at like craft stores, you know, to display their product. And they, um, you know, the case study about it is like, oh yeah, they saw this huge jump in sales. Like every time they had these events, like everyone was buying Fiskars brand scissors and then Fiskars chose to close the community. Like they were like done when we did community or I don't know, we had success or, you know, something happened internally and they closed that community and it's still like people, you know, it might've been before Facebook groups was a thing. Um, but people migrated to like other spaces to try to rebuild these communities because these crafters were like, we know each other. We want to talk about crafts. We don't necessarily need Fiskars. <laughs> exactly. So there's definitely, you know, room to, to do that. And it's great that they weren't like, no, this is our branded community. Like we must close this Facebook group because we're no longer around. Exactly. Exactly. You can't stop the people when they crave a space to just kind of be themselves and, and talk about a common interest or goal. For sure. So what were your goals as the community manager during this transition, besides obviously being transparent and being there for the community? What did you look at the end of the day was, you know, your success through this transition? Mm, that's a really good question. I'm going to think about that one for a minute. I mean, you definitely hit them spot on. I say that the first was definitely just, you know, being transparent, being honest, um, also making sure that the transition was as comfortable as possible and just being a resource, like being accessible and available. Um, I definitely like stayed after hours to make sure that I was there because I, I mean, it was already tough enough that we were going through the situation. So being accessible, um, also making them feel that they were heard as well. They had a lot to say and I thought it was very important. And so I was like very hands-on with this particular community. I mean, I had phone calls with the, the moderators and champions because I really depended on them um, to really just drive the community. And they were so helpful and so amazing. I mean, these are, some of them were, you know, stay-at-home moms, full-time employees, and they were so passionate about the the app and the community that they did this as a side hustle, like just free to the point where one of our our head of communities, she wanted to help one of them get a job because she was so good at moderating and doing what she did. And so I think just being accessible and also just making sure that everything was as smooth as possible, that was also key. So we really tried to, again, focus on the positive content wise. So we would do, you know, fun, lighthearted posts to make people feel good because we all knew where it was headed. But I think in, in the between time, I want to say, we really tried to just focus on the positive aspects. That was like the main goal there. Awesome. How did you um, feel about some of the secrecy that you had to balance with like really wanting to be transparent? Um, were there any points where, you know, you had to have some conversations with management, like we have to tell these people or were there, were there, um, you know, times where it was more like, no, these are the steps we just have to take through this process because you know if especially if you're not on the executive team like you as an employee may not have known yeah. everything exactly. even in the most transparent companies <laughs> exactly. exactly that's a good point and I think because we were such a small startup it was like the CEO you know head of product that we were all in meetings together trying to brainstorm and so they were very supportive I didn't really have to have conversations with them but I think for me it was tough to just meet with my champions and they would ask questions and I really just couldn't give them the answers. And so I think just having that poker face or, you know, brainstorming about ideas when I knew what was going to happen, that was just really, really challenging. And I honestly forget the last part of that question, Erica. So I just want to revisit that if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just the, how kind of the secrecy, like, was it kind of built into the steps, like the slow reveal? 
yes, I would say it was definitely built into the steps. And I feel like I had to constantly remind myself of like, okay, this is what I can say. And this is what I cannot share. And like kind of compartmentalize those things just so that nothing accidentally, you know, came out in conversation with the moderators. And so, yes, definitely revisiting like, okay, what are we able to share? What are we not able to share? And really also not making promises that you can't keep because that's the, that's the worst. You know, if you have good intentions and you make a promise, but you know that it isn't going to be fulfilled or it's going to be tough or you don't know for sure if, you know, you'll have support. That was another thing is like not making promises that I couldn't keep. Um, but it was, it was very tough, I would say, to keep that secrecy. I'm kind of imagining you with like your monitor has like sticky notes and it's like, don't say this, <laughs> say this. <laughs> visual person like a visual learner like that's how that's the best way for me to compartmentalize okay things not to say and then everything I can say and like only look at what I can say oh yeah mm-hmm yep <laughs> spot on Erica spot on yes <laughs> um so just as a reminder for everyone who's enjoying this webinar if you have any questions for Terry you can either hit the chat if you're in zoom or you can use your Facebook comments if you're on Facebook. Um, so I would love to hear about some of the metrics that you were tracking for your community health or business value, or if at you know, any point, um, you know, anyone came during this transition, anyone came to you from the company and said like, tell me what the business value of this community is, or like, what are we leaving behind? Absolutely. So one, I also want to share one of my favorite uh, tools for tracking metrics for Facebook groups specifically, just because it took me forever to find a resource. When I first started in the role, I had a spreadsheet, my handy dandy spreadsheet. And every week I go through all the posts to kind of see like, okay, how many, how much engagement did we get here? Who was communicating in the group? And it was very tedious and gnarly. So I, I had that tool that I'd love to share in one moment, but I would say the first metric is just like audience, right? Who is your ideal community member? Um, that's it's been something that I've realized the importance of over the years because if you have this you know community member avatar and you know what that sweet spot is you're really able to cater the content that you create the experiences that you create for that target market and so of course you'll have community members that don't really fit that avatar but if you know your sweet spot you're able to always speak to that and serve your ideal community members so I think that's really important um, also I think applause so like what are they liking how often are they liking this um, whatever they're liking within the community could be a really great tool to use outside of the community to drive lookalike audiences, right? So if you know that folks are gravitating toward a certain post, post use it for marketing. I would also say um, engagement. So what are they commenting on? What are they sharing? What are they, you know, clicking on? Um, and that'll also drive other marketing efforts as well, but just getting a better idea on what the community is interested in. Um, let's see. I'd also say feature and feedback requests. I call myself the survey queen because I send out a survey to my email list, my community. I may send them surveys plenty of times throughout the year because I always want to know, how can I serve you? How can I provide value? Because if I'm not providing value, there's no reason for me to be here. That's just my personal philosophy. And so I always want to tap into, you know, what, how can we make this better? Like, what are your feature and feedback requests? Um, and the tool that I want to share, I'll actually leave this in chat, is Gritex. So Gritex is a great analytics and management tool for Facebook groups. And I'll go ahead and just put this in chat. I can't multitask, Erica, so don't judge me. It's all right. <laughs> does it, does Gri I assume Gritex still works with some of the Facebook API changes, because they do know that they made some or are making some changes that people were really concerned that their outside tools were no longer going to be able to connect with Facebook. Oh, that's a good question. Let me just take a quick search. I really hope so, because Gritex really saves so much time. I mean, it gives you Looks like their site is still up and there's a 14 days free trial. So I think they should be good. Um, but I can definitely circle back on that and get back to the community. to let Yeah, them it's definitely just something to be aware of. Like, I mean, this is, I used to work at a software company and that was like a constant struggle was like, if these companies cut off access to us or want us to go to a certain provider that they have chosen as the best provider and then we're, paying a lot of money, uh, a lot, it adds up very quickly <laughs> um, to serve your customers. So 
it's always something when you are selecting third party tools that you should think about um, and how you're dependent on the different services for your community management. That's something everyone should consider. <laughs> So I want to talk more about you being the survey queen. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> um, so when you send out surveys, um, how do you, how do you motivate your members to take them? And kind of like, what threshold are you looking to? You say like, I really have enough quality, quantity, like quality and quantity to say like this survey, the results I got from it actually mean what I'm hoping it means so I can have direction on my programming or product or whatever I'm working on. For sure. That's a really great question. I think it really depends on like the size of the community, especially. And then also, of course, your sur survey response rate and any trends that you see. But I would say that surveys are just like one tool in my toolbox. I have others that I'd love to share with you as well. <laughs> but as far as surveys, like best practices, I try to keep them as short as possible because people are busy. They have busy lives. And so I try to stick with a max five questions. And so that makes it very, you know, you have to get really serious about what you want to ask, right? So I try to figure out, okay, what are the key results? Like, what do I want to get from my community here? And then try to figure out what those five questions might be. I also love open-ended questions so that they can share more. I like to also frame my questions in a positive manner. So instead of, you know, um, why, you know, what don't you like about our community, right? Because some folks are like, oh, I, I like everything. I don't want to be, I don't want to be that person to provide negative feedback. But instead, you might want to ask, how can we improve? Or what can we do better? Or what, what would you like to see more of? And so I think that's like a best practice for surveys. I'm also good for when I first started, at least I'm a little busier now, but scheduling one on ones with random community members, I would just like put a notice out there like, hey, the first 10 folks that reply, let's hop on the on the phone for a 15 minute sync where I can learn more about them, why they're part of the community, you know, what they want to see, what they want to see less of, things like that. Um, personal messages, whether it's like Facebook or whatever community tool you're using, personal messages are great as well. I think folks tend to respond more when it's a personalized approach versus the, you know, hey everyone, hey all, complete the survey, right? The personalized, like use their name, you know, all the best practices um, that we've learned about, I feel like, in the past. So those are like the best practices for me when it comes to like getting feedback, surveys, and all that good stuff. And how do you kind of tell like, okay, this survey has enough responses or like this time period is over, it's all good. Do you have like a percentage of your community threshold that you're trying to hit? Yeah, I would say, I, I like, I feel like 20 to 25% is always a good number for me. It seems to work and I get quality data. Um, we just hosted an event and I, I literally use surveys for like everything. So we hosted an event recently and the feedback was great in person. And I think we had a, maybe like 60 people attend and maybe 20 folks completed the survey and they provided so much valuable feedback in that survey and so we were I felt really solid on what we, even though 20 only 20 people replied it was like okay we got a lot of great a lot of great information based on what the 20 people provided and so I think um, just kind of testing things out and kind of seeing like what works best for you what feels good as far as like a percentage you know a survey response rate um, and so that's that's kind of the my I want to say best practice there. Yeah, I mean, if you had 60 people at the event and 20 people took it, it's a third of the audience, which is a pretty exactly. sizable. Um, another like community manager like thing, especially if you're doing events, is people uh, definitely think there's like majorities and plurality in a room of mm -hmm. like opinions or different types of people or whatever when it hits that 30 percent mark so it's like sure. something in our <laughs> brains and how we you know like culturally interact that like 30 percent is just like that threshold exactly it's like okay we got some good data here we have something we can work with yeah <laughs> or if you're trying to change something and you're like what's that threshold i need to get it to to change 30 <laughs> percent Awesome. So I'd love to hear you. You said you had other tools besides surveys. So I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, for sure. So let's see that in addition to like scheduling one on ones and doing the personal messages. One thing we do at Asana, we have like a customer stories program. It's more internally, but it might it might be helpful for a community management or their program out there. And so what we do 
um, is we share like inspiring customer stories, but we try to share them with non customer facing teams so that folks on like the engineering team can see how their hard work is, you know, relating back to the customer journey and the customer story and just make folks feel more fulfilled at work and kind of like see exactly how their contribution is impacting the company and the customer. So I think customer stories like circulating that internally is really helpful. Um, we have what we call a voice of customer project with like probably thousands of tasks or like hundreds of tasks at least where we are constantly you know, updating that with feature and feedback request and sharing that with our product managers, not just so they can kind of like say, okay, great, this is the feedback we got, we'll brush it under the rug. But no, they actually look at it and that informs our roadmap. And so I think that's also really helpful. And then again, asking the right questions. So we talked about earlier, like framing questions in a positive manner, because I would say you, you will have devil's advocates out there, but I, I feel in my experience, most people, they don't want to be that person. They don't want to provide negative feedback. So framing your questions in the right way, I think that's also really key. And that can also boost some of the survey responses as well. Yeah, I've definitely seen more success framing in a positive manner. Like how can I improve the event versus tell me the one thing you didn't like about the event. And exactly. people, you can tell people are hesitant in their answers and they'll be like, well, you know, I got a coffee and it was a little cold. And you're like, that's not exactly. super helpful <laughs> at the end of the day. <laughs> um, or, or, or it can put them in like a negative mindset if they are taking that survey. And, you, and when you want to pull out both the positives and the improvements, yeah. then they're kind of less likely to be like, well, I also enjoyed this. Exactly. That's so true. So true, Erica. Oh, so I, uh, so I love this like customer stories and feedback and stuff that you're, you know, sending to your engineering teams, your product teams, people who probably, some people who probably don't deal with customers at all, mm -hmm. uh, our community members. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know, like Asana as a company and kind of the team structure and the team layout just so, cause I know people who are listening to this they're working in communities of all sizes. They're working at companies of all sizes. And sometimes, you know, I mean, at CMX, we're three people. And, you know, well, you know, you'll listen to something like this or you'll learn from someone else. And you're like, wow, that community program sounds amazing. But, like, I can't do it. <laughs> or, like, I can do it at this scale. <laughs> the teeny scale. Yep. So I think that would be great context for everyone to have so they can kind of know a little bit more. For sure. And just like the framework of our teams at Asana, is that right? Yeah. Okay, great. So I would say, well, I've been at Asana for two years now. Um, and when I first started, we were probably around like 200 employees or somewhere around that mark. And now after two years, we're, we're like well over 350 and we're just growing. And so it, the company's growing really, really fast. Um, I also say that we are like a non-hierarchical company. So we don't have like an organizational chart and you don't see like, okay, this person's here at the top. We all work in an open space. And so we're kind of like, we're all peers that are driving the mission forward. And so when it comes to community, um, I have a colleague in Dublin that manages community. Um, I'm actually not sure how many community managers or how many folks in the community we have. I know we have like millions of users. Um, as far as active community members, I do not want to lie to you. I don't have that number right now. I want to say it's probably a few thousand, but that I, I don't want to, put a number out there and uh, give me wrong information. With our company being like, you know, 350 at this point, we have, we have a pretty large community. We have an internal tool that we use to manage the community sort of in, uh, I think we're, we're synced or in, we integrate with Discuss where we're able to, um, you know, just chat within the tool. And that's kind of what we use to moderate um, the communications as well. Yeah. Does that answer the question, Erica? Yeah, I think it does. And you're you're in the customer success crew. And how many people are who how many people work with you in customer success? So in customer success, let's see. So our customer success team is broken up into three teams. And so we have the implementation. So that's the team that I focus on. And I have at this point, we're actually we have a lot of like movement in the org right now and we're like hiring, FYI. <laughs> we're hiring. Um so we let's see, we have about five, I want to say five to seven team members on implementation. And then we have implementation is all about getting customers onboarded with the tool and helping them succeed. We then have scaled resources, which is more of like our, you know, self-service. So our webinars, our online courses, and I have colleagues that work there. And then we also have our dedicated, which is more of the 
strategic and like the enterprise customers. And I have, I want to say maybe five or so colleagues that are in dedicated. Awesome. Yeah, that gives everyone like, I think a great, oh. kind of, you know, look at your scale of your company and exactly. And I just thought of one other thing, Erica. So one thing we do that's really cool at Asana is we, so when I was on user support, uh, user operations, when I first started, we have a task for folks around the company to moderate in the community. So if you ever, like if you're in Eng or you're in product or you're in finance and you want to get more in tune with customers and want to have those conversations, we create a task for them in Asana and we invite them to moderate or answer a few questions in the community so they can just get, you know, just introduce themselves to community members, get a feel for what type of questions are being asked and also make it feel more of a team collaborative effort. And so that was kind of neat too, to do that, uh, that initiative within the company. Nice. Yeah, I think that is a great way to get people active and understanding and also, under, you know, I think it's always good to understand your coworkers' jobs <laughs> and what they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, you may not, you know, know all the details or you may not have all the skills that they have to do it, but having that empathy to relate to their situation is just going to make your working relationship so much better. Um, I've definitely, you know, worked at larger companies and we would do some of these initiatives. Um, one of actually some people's favorite thing to do, like one of our finance guys, he loved when we had our big customer conference because he got to help out on Twitter. <laughs> and so he just got to like answer people, you know, who were excited about the conference off the conference, tweeting about it. And, you know, sometimes people needing some assistance, like, hey, where, where's the restroom? Or like, where do I go to get this? And he'd be like, right on it. And he just loved, like, he's like, I'm not just behind like a spreadsheet. Like I get to interact with people and get to know them. And it created, you know, a much better relationship. Like on my end, I had to work with him very closely, putting on the event from like a budgetary standpoint. And like, we developed a really good relationship and we're actually still friends. Um, we hang out regularly, but you know, it was exciting to see, he wasn't the only one at this company that was excited to have that interaction and get to know the customers and put more purpose behind their work. So important, Erica, to see how other folks are doing the work. I've had people come up to me at the company and they're like, not to be offensive, but like, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, great, come and shadow me on a call. And they're like, oh, this is, okay, gotcha. This makes sense. I get it, right? Yes. Or uh, why are you on Facebook all day, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a good point. When I managed community, I was very like self-conscious when, you know, I had Facebook up. I'm like, guys, I managed a community in Facebook. I promise I'm not just like scrolling down my timeline. <laughs> yep. You're like, I'm not just liking friends' pictures of their exactly. dogs and kids. Yes. I swear. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> I think we've all been there. Um, so is there anything that I have not asked you around everything we've been talking about before we jump to our quick fire questions that you would like to address or add to our conversation? That's a really good question, Erica. Let me think. I'm like, oh gosh. What are you <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think you did a really good job with the questions and I, I think you covered everything. Oh, yay. Okay. So we will jump <laughs> into our quick fire questions. Okay. Um, so I would love for you to find, to define what community means to you. Mm. Let's see, to me, community is a, I would say a safe space with like-minded people that have a common goal or interest. I like it. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah. So can you speak uh, to what books or other media um, that has really changed your life? For sure. Now this, let's see, I, I have tons of, I love to read. I have tons of books out there that I would love to recommend. They aren't necessarily related to community per se, but they're, I would say they relate to, you know, dealing with people. So that always helps, right? The first is the classic Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey, like that book has been a game changer for my life personally. So that'd be one book. Um, I would also say Let's see, The Secret, which is not a book, but it's a medium, right? Uh, that's a classic as well, one of my favorites. And then also, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. That book is a game changer as well. I can, maybe I can type them out and leave them in a comment or chat. 
<laughs> or or we can have someone someone in the community can hop in. Yeah. Anyway, so you don't have to hear us type this. Exactly. That's the worst sound. <laughs> type down your computer, your microphone's picking up. <laughs> All right, for our next question, who do you look up to in this industry? Well, you, Erica, of course. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blushing, Erica. Okay, let's see. I would say um, who, one woman that I absolutely love, and she is a she's an incredible businesswoman and also a community builder. Not formally, but, I mean, she's a, she's a great community builder. That's Lisa Nichols. And the thing I love about, there's so much to love about Lisa Nichols. She's a motivational speaker, best-selling author. Um, but what I love about her is that she can be on a stage speaking to her community members or her audience, and there can be thousands of people there, but she isn't speaking at you. She has a conversation with you. And so you can be in that community or in that audience, and you feel part of her community. She has her own language that she, that she uses within her community. Um, and so to give you an example, one thing that she usually says, you know, if, if she's, she's like, if you resonate you know, if, you, if this resonates with you, say yes, yes. And so I noticed that people that are in my community, because our, our target markets sort of overlap, folks in my community will comment on something they agree with, whether it's a quote or, you know, some kind of story. And they're like, yes, yes. I'm like, oh, that's Lisa's. I, I just know that it's Lisa's. That's one of our community members. And it's kind of cool to be able to see that. Um, I would also say uh, Shira Levine, who's a pioneer and innovator in the online community space. Um, she was a global community manager at Zynga for about three years or maybe a little more than three years. And I had a chance to kind of sit under her tutelage in my first role as a community member or community manager and picked up so many valuable tools from her. Um, she's a rock star and just watching her work and just be brilliant was game changing for me. So those are the two women I'd say I look up to. Awesome. I'm less familiar with Lisa, but I'm definitely going to look up her work now that you recommended her. And mm -hmm. we love Shara. She's, she's great. Amazing. Alrighty. So what's another community outside of your company or, you know, past communities you've worked with that you are constantly impressed by? Ooh. Erica, are you familiar with Gary V, like Gary Vaynerchuk? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think his community, like if you go to whether it's his Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, the folks that follow him, him and Lewis Howes, like I notice I love their content. Um, the folks that follow them in their communities, they are like super ambitious, go getting people in the world, but they still find time to provide value in the comment section of their posts and in their community. And so those are two folks that have really great communities that are super engaging. I mean, the people, they, they leave comments constantly and they always add value and just say a lot of positive things and so I think those two communities are really um, impressive and I have to say the Asana community I know it's cliche but I do be and the reason is because we have so many volunteers around the world that are in the community constantly providing value and feedback and you know asking for swag they love Asana swag and are like you know the unicorns are a big deal when it comes to Asana and our narwhals and all the fun characters and so I would say our community members as well um, and then Apple, I think Apple has an occult following and the community that Apple has attracted is pretty impressive as well. They do indeed know how to make those lines for those phones. Which I'm always, exactly, exactly. I'm not that type of person. I'm like, I would not stand in line for a phone and get later. <laughs> One of my colleagues at the office, he's like, oh, the new Apple Watch came out. I'm going to get it now. I'm like, well, I wish I had rich people props. <laughs> you know. <laughs> all righty so our last question which is always always the question everyone has the most fun with if you could distill your message into one sentence what would you say okay one sentence think about it my one sentence would be Create the spaces you crave and be kind while doing so. Create the spaces you crave. There we go. That's it. I'm sticking with it, Erica. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> Beautiful. Love it. Love thank it. You. All righty. Well, thank you so much, Terry. And if you want to let people like know where to find you besides hopping in the Asana community. Yeah. Absolutely. So you can find me on 
Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, it's going to be at Terry Lomax. Awesome. And you're at the Mocha Girls Pit Stop blog? Yep. And Mocha Girls Pit Stop blog.com. Or if that's too much to remember, I get it. You can visit terrylomax.com and just click on the blog uh, link at the top and you'll be all set. Great. And if you want to see Terry talk more, you should come to see Max Summit. Wait, we just sold out of tickets, but you can get on the wait list and cross your fingers. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Thank you so much for having me, Erica. Yeah, was- thanks for being on. Yes. It's so lovely. And I will see you soon. And thank you, everyone who joined us for this conversation. I hope you have a magical day. Yeah. <laughs> Bye.